title of today's sermon is Rescue from the Pits We Dig, or Saved from the Pits We Dig, and then fall into. Often in life, we dig pits. And I'm going to tell you a story here about when I was younger. When I was younger, we used to take family trips at the end of every summer. And they would usually happen at the end of August, or the beginning of September, just before school started. Up north, school didn't start until after Labor Day. And this began when I was about five years old. And usually my mom would invite her sister, they were best friends growing up, and her sister's family would come as well. So there would be our four from our family, and four from another family. And so there'd be eight of us going to the beach for two weeks. And our first trip was to Seaside Heights, New Jersey. I don't know if you've ever been there. It was just some cheap motel. And back then, in the early 1980s, it was pay access and pay toilets on the beach. Nothing spectacular. Later they realized there were better locations. And we started going to places like Wildwood, New Jersey. And we would stay in a place, instead of a motel, you could rent out a house for two weeks. And it was fairly cheap, and you stay on the beach. Um, I was convinced that Wildwood, Wildwood, New Jersey was run by the mob. <laughs> because you could go into any restaurant, even the fast food Chinese restaurant, and order spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> Every restaurant. So we rented the house, and it was not exactly the greatest house. Imagine the John Candy movie Summer Rental, for those of you who remember that movie, where the rental house was on the public access path on the way to the beach. Strangers walking by your kitchen every morning watching you eat breakfast. As John Candy would say, I'm John Q. Public. Welcome to my beach. Later, we made it to what was one of the nicest beach locations for summer vacations at the beach, and that was Ocean City, Maryland. Nice high-rise hotels and condo units, large beaches, good waves, and enough room to build yourself a bear trap. So when I was young, my uncle would tell me about building bear traps, and I'm not really certain if it was true or just something he gave us to do to fill time so that the kids wouldn't bother him and we could sleep on the beach. Don't know. But one time he dug a huge hole in the sand. And so every year after that, us kids would dig a giant hole in the sand. It was sort of a tradition for every family vacation. And it would take like three or four hours of digging to get it about four or five feet deep. And you'd have to dig at the back of the beach, near the motel, the hotel, because if you dig in the front, you're, you know, a foot down, you're in mud. You can't dig mud, you can't get very deep. And so we'd have a great time climbing into it, and climbing out of it, and climbing into it, and climbing out of it. At the end of the day, you'd fill it all back in. And then maybe another day you'd start over and dig yet another trap. When we got older, when we were, you know, teenagers, we would have someone stand in the hole at the end of the day, and then we'd bury them up to their neck. And so it's you know, five foot of sand all buried up to here. I can tell you from experience that the sand is cool or cold. So you're at the beach, it's 90 degrees, but down there, all the sand against your body, it's cool. And the weight of the sand presses on your chest and makes it tough to breathe. One time, the police officer came by and told us to stop and fill in the bear trap. And when you're a teenager and younger, you never really think about the consequences. But cave-ins do happen. If any of you have ever seen them dig a trench anywhere, you know they build it with walls and supports to keep the sides from caving in. Utility workers sometimes die when the trench caves in. They just literally get buried. And the weight of the dirt is just absolutely heavy. And it takes way more than five minutes to dig somebody out. I know that from experience, because when you bury somebody up to their neck, it takes about 10 minutes to get them out. You just can't hold your breath long enough. And with the weight of that trench caving in, if it ever did, 
it would probably knock you out and you'd be done. So here's the question. Why do we like to dig pits? Well, some of us like to set traps for other people. We like to see them get caught, get their comeuppance, or just get stopped from what they're doing. We like to interfere in other people's lives. You know, their business is our business. How about an example? That's Fred, and that's from Scooby-Doo, and that's some elaborate trap he's got drawn up there. He drives around with his friends in a cool van and solves mysteries, and he always comes up with some kind of weird trap to capture the bad guy, and the bad guy who's always in some kind of mask or costume, or sometimes there's a mask underneath the mask, so the tricks him. Sometimes there's a celebrity involved, like Don Knox or the Harlem Globetrotters who try and help him out. And it always turns out to be like some old man Smithers or something like that who's some grumpy, disgruntled guy about something happening in town, right? And eventually there's always a logical explanation for the ghosts or the bizarre things that happen in Scooby-Doo. But if you've ever watched it, one thing always happens. The trap almost always is super complicated and almost always backfires, right? With Scooby or Shaggy or all five of them getting stuck in their own trap. Always, right? And then there's a couple of more minutes, and somehow they get out and solve the mystery. But they always end up in their own trap. Why else do we like to dig pits? Sometimes we dig pits because we honestly like to climb into them. It's our favorite pit, our favorite sin. And I'll read you this story here. This is Gina's story. It says, I was, in active I was in active addiction since I was 13, and I started doing heroin and continued until I was 33. I was an outgoing person, and my soul shined through my eyes. But without ever hearing about her story, you would never understand the trials and tribulations you have to endure when you love that sin, that pit, so much. She says, in 2005, I was getting out, getting high, and I fell 20 feet and broke my back and my wrist. But I kept staying out. I was only 70 pounds at that point. You love your sin so much, you don't even eat anymore. My family had to prepare for my funeral. I told my mom, I'm going to die. And it was my destiny. We love it so much, we can't let go. We love it so much, we like falling in. And then when you're down in the pit, like Gina, you get depressed and say, this is it. We fall into a second pit within the first pit of either depression or anxiety or loneliness. And so now here, you're, you're in double D, right? A pit within a pit. Like I said, sometimes we just like to fall into those pits. We can't let it go. It's insane. Think about this. If you had cancer, would you ever say to yourself, you know, I think I'd like to relapse. It might be fun. One of these times, the cave-in is going to happen. And you're going to be buried and died in your pit of sin that you love so much. Let's go to God's Word and see what he says about digging pits. I'll give you a moment here. This is from Proverbs 26. I have about five verses here and then a couple of Bible parables and stories. Proverbs 26, verse 27. I'll we'll let you get there in your own Bible. I'll also have it on the screen. Proverbs 26, 27 says... Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. Someone rolls a stone, and guess what? It's going to roll back on you. We'll turn over to Psalms. Most of these are in Psalms or Proverbs or Ecclesiastes. Psalm 7, verse 15. Whoever digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit they have made. Let's 
Likewise, flipping over here, we're going to go back and forth. This is Ecclesiastes 10. I'll give you a moment to get there and your device or your, your pages flipping. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8. Whoever digs a pit may fall into it. Whoever breaks through a wall may be bitten by a snake. There are some consequences here, right? Yes. Going back to Psalms, Psalms chapter 9. This isn't just individual. The nations have fallen, this is Psalms 9 verse 15, the nations have fallen into the pit they have dug. Their feet are caught in the net they have hidden. So all this scheming that you do on a personal level can go to the corporate level. The entire nation, the entire country can get caught in the same pit, the trap they're laying. Psalms 56, they spread a net for my feet, I was bowed down in distress, they have dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. As you can see from each of these five Bible verses, if you dig a pit, you're going to be the one that falls into it. Just like Fred and Scooby and, you know, you're going to get caught in your own trap. So it's not stated directly, but I'm going to say it. Don't dig pits. Don't put out stumbling blocks. It's going to be like Scooby-Doo. You and Shaggy, you're going to get caught in Fred's trap. <laughs> move on here to a, a Bible story. You can see a king on the far right, a famous queen in the middle, and a very unlucky person on the far left. Can you identify this Bible story? This is Esther. And that's Esther and Haman. And we all know about Haman's absolute hatred of Mordecai. I mean, Mordecai was a very faithful Jew. And so when Haman would go by, all the townspeople were supposed to kneel and bow down. And Mordecai was like, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. And so Haman just, just ate away at him. You can't have one person who won't do what I tell him. If you turn with me, we'll read how the story ends. I'm sure most of you realize this. Turn with me to Esther 7. We'll all turn together here in the Bible. It is not on the screen. Esther chapter 7. And we're going to read all of chapter 7. And while you're flipping pages, remember, Haman has got so angry at Mordecai, he's now set a trap for all the Jews. They set up a day when they're going to go out and kill everybody. And he doesn't realize that the queen is related to... He's related. Right? So Haman, Haman's in trouble. Haman's going to set his own trap. It's going to backfire fabulously right in front of the king. Right on stage, right? Esther chapter 7. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. Remember Queen Esther is... Finally realized, I have to pray about this. I'm going to go to the king, my husband. He's going to hold out the scepter. He's going to say, you know, whatever you ask up to half the kingdom. And he says, oh, I'm going to make a party. We're going to have a party. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. And Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life. King started wondering, what? where's this one? This is my petition, and spare my people, this is my request. For I and my people have been sold for destruction and slaughter and annihilation. If we were merely sold as slaves, male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet. Because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. So the husband, he's outraged. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is the man who would dare do such a thing? And Esther said, the adversary and enemy is the vile Haman. Oof. Haman's thinking, this party's going to be for me. I've set the trap. It's all going to work out. I'm going to be elevated to like second in the kingdom. Nope. Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out in the palace garden. He needed to take a walk. He was so upset at dinner. Couldn't even finish. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. 
And just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. This is looking like he's falling on top of the queen. This is going downhill really fast. And the king exclaimed, will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered the king's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A gallows 75 feet high stands at Haman's house. He had made it for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. Because, you know, the kings realized that Mordecai was at the gate. He realized there was, you know, this insurrection. He warned the king about the people who were going to try and kill him. And so, you know, Haman's not realizing what's going to happen. And so the king realizes, this really is my adversary. And so the king says, hang him on his own gallows. So they hang Haman on the gallows he prepared for Mordecai. And then the king's fury subsided. All his plans, all his traps, they backfired spectacularly. Just like a Scooby-Doo end of the show trap. And he died on his own gallows. What can we do instead? The good news is that there are already plenty, plenty of stumbling blocks and troubles out there. And most of us, let's be honest, don't have our spiritual eyes totally open anyways. We're looking down at our phone or something else. We got our eyes on something other than the Lord. We got our eyes on something earthly. And we're crossing the street while looking down, and driving our car while looking down. Trouble is going to collide with you. You don't have to dig your own pit. It's going to find you. Just be patient. It will come find you. And your character will be tried during your time in the pit that you've collided with. Kind of like Daniel in the lion's den. Or like Jeremiah on my next slide. As a follower of Christ, you're going to be doing God's work, and there's going to be some trials. There's going to be a pit you slide into of, that you didn't dig, and if not, you're on a cord, and it's because you were faithfully following God's word. So turn with me to Jeremiah 38. Again, not on the screen. Jeremiah chapter 38. And while we're here, I'll lay the background of this story. As you know, the kingdom of Israel has split long ago into two kingdoms. The northern half of Israel, the southern half of Judah. The northern kingdom had bad kings, all bad kings. And the northern kingdom of Israel was taken away by the Samaritans, or the Assyrians. And the southern kingdom of Judah had a good king and a bad king, and then a good king and a good king and a bad king and a bad king and a good king and a bad king. So they lasted a little bit longer. Eventually, though, they started going just sideways with their faithfulness to God. And eventually, their kingdom got smaller and smaller and smaller, and they started to get the siege here and there. And eventually, they realized that the Babylonians were coming. And uh, unfortunately, one of the kings, you know, decided to tell the Babylonians all about his treasures rather than about his God. Because one day it's all going to get taken away from him. And so Jeremiah is preaching here. And he says, look, this has gone downhill. God is saying the time is up. There's some judgment involved. If you do your best, essentially surrender. No one ever wants to hear it's time to give up and surrender. It's very unpopular, especially for people in power. It's like challenging their authority. Jeremiah chapter 38. It says, Shephatiah, son of Matan, and Gedaliah, son of Pashur, Jehukal, son of Shelemiah, and Pashur, son of Melchijah, heard what Jeremiah was telling all the people when he said, This is what the Lord says. Whoever stays in the city will die by the sword, famine, or plague, but whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. He's telling you, surrender and live. Says he will escape with his life, he will live. And this is what the Lord says 
This city will certainly be handed over to the army of the king of Babylon, who, could, who will capture it. And that's really unpopular. So all the officials said to the king, This man should be put to death. He is discouraging the soldiers who are left in the city, as well as all the people, by the things he is saying to them. This man is not seeking the good of these people, but their ruin. But they don't realize this is God's prophet. And of course, the king doesn't want to step in. So he says, he's in your hands. The king can do nothing to oppose you. So they took Jeremiah and put him in the cistern of Mount Hijah, the king's son, who was in the courtyard of the guard. They lowered Jeremiah by ropes into the cistern with the water in it. It had no water in it, only mud, and Jeremiah sank down with the mud. So he's in the prison in the cistern. But even Malik, a Cushite, an official in the royal palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. And while the king was sitting at the Benjamin gate, Ebed Melech went out to the palace and said to him, My lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. They have thrown him in a cistern where he will starve to death, for there is no longer any bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed Melech the Cushite, Take thirty men here with you and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So Ebed Melech took the men with him. Went to a room under the treasury of the palace. He took some old rags, worn out clothes from there, and let them down with ropes to Jeremiah in the cistern. And Ebed Melech the Cushite said to Jeremiah, Put these old rags and worn out clothes under your arms to pad the ropes. Jeremiah did so, and they pulled him up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern, and he remained in the courtyard of the guard. He's a man of God. And of course, as we know, the prophets had tough lives. And John the Baptist lost his head. But that shouldn't, shouldn't stop you from being faithful. Your enemies, which are from Satan, are going to come after you because you're a Christian. And they're going to try and toss you into a pit. They're going to try and get you to go back on preaching the word. Get you to stop. Stop preaching, surrender and live. Surrender to your God and live. And so, as a Christian, you're going to end up probably in some pit prepared for you by Satan, who's trying to test your character in this great controversy that you can't see behind you, like Daniel going into the lion's den. But guess what? Jeremiah is rescued through the faithfulness of Ebed Melech. Do you know what Ebed, Ebed Melech means? Means serving the king. And Jeremiah survives the famine, survives the siege of the city when it falls, and he's one of the people who's set free when the city falls. Everybody else who defied the word of the Lord, they perish. The Babylonians come and they leave the land to the poor. Right? Everybody else gets carried away. So let's sum this up today as we close. First and foremost, don't play around with your favorite pit of sin. The bear trap you dig at the beach for fun because it's going to cave in one day and take your life, your eternal life. And as we've shown in the story of Jeremiah, we can think about Daniel, John the Baptist, there are already enough pits and traps out there already, yeah. most of which you cannot see and you cannot avoid because your Christian walk and Christian faith is on a path that Satan opposes. And these may actually be part of your character building process. God will lift you out of those pits that you go into because of your faith, just like he did for Jeremiah. And even if you die in that pit for your faith, just remember, he will lift up John the Baptist one day when that last trumpet sounds. Let us close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your faithfulness. We pray, Lord, we can put away all the sins that we are so easily tempted with, all the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, all the earthly pleasures, because, Lord, we know that these things are going to take us down. We pray, Lord, your Holy Spirit will give us strength to stay on target, to survive the temptations, just as Christ did in the wilderness. And we pray, Lord, that you will come soon and take us home. And our character will be one of faithfulness, and you will find us sojourning 
of being faithful and just and true and spreading your word. And we pray. We ask this in your name. Amen.